Festive Session 3 in Feb Festive 2022. Tonight we have Alan, Alan Carter, who's joining us from, from Aberdeen. And Alan is here to talk to us about allotment forest gardening. Alan has his own plot at the Bedford Road allotments up in Aberdeen. And you may have noticed from the blurb that we put onto the website that Alan has also published on the topic of uh, forest growing. So he, Alan's book is called A Food Forest, Plant It, Grow It, Cook It. So I will say no more myself about what Alan's expertise is. He'll tell you all about that over the next uh, however long. And then when Alan's finished with his presentation, we've got a chance to ask questions and have a conversation around all of this as well. So if you're ready, Alan, I'll just pass over to you. Okay, thanks, Scott. And uh, I'll just share my screen because I've, I've got a slideshow about the, the allotments. So to start with, well, welcome to my allotment. Um, there's a, the Bedford Road allotments are a very wee allotment site. There's only actually four sites, uh, four plots, and they're about 100 metres from my front door. So it's really, really handy for me. Um, and it's very nice because it kind of means you can get to know everyone on the site. Um, and that, that probably helps when you're doing a more kind of experimental growing technique like I am, because you can you can basically speak to, to everybody about it. Uh, nobody's wondering what on earth you're doing. Uh, so inside, the, this is an uh, aerial picture of my, my plots, and not, not at the moment, in summer. Um, and this is what it looks like sort of in the, the thick of it. Um, so I'll talk a wee bit about uh, forest gardening its, itself. Um, and this was my introduction to it uh, about 30 years now. Uh, I was studying forestry at Aberdeen University um, and I came across this uh, poster advertising a, a talk. Uh, Mike Daw, who was giving the talk, was uh, a food and agriculture expert. Um, one of these people who sort of jetted around the world giving people advice on their, uh, their agricultural systems. And he'd been asked to, to go and look at uh, these Indonesian home gardens, which is the, the term they had given Indonesia to, to forest gardens. And they, they really invented the, um, the system over there. Uh, and the, the basic thrust of Mike's talk was that he hadn't really been able to, to give them any advice because the system was perfect already. Um, it already made the optimum use of uh, the, the light, the water, everything available. Um, and all he could say was a little bit about sort of animal health within it. Uh, so I'll give you a look at the sort of thing Michael has seen. Uh, this is a, a forest garden in, in Indonesia, uh, swiped off the internet. Um, and you can, oh, the only clue is this tiny little bit of roof in the middle of, of this thick forest that this is actually not just a wild forest. It's a, it's a cultivated thing. In fact, it's, it's somebody's house. Um, and so I won't say I recognize all these species, but I, I do see there's, there's bananas here. And you'll have things like jackfruit and coconuts in the canopy lower down. Um, you've got some more bananas, uh, things like, uh, looks like sweet corn to me. Um, you've got citrus, uh, that's maybe some aubergines down at the, the bottom. Um, so but basically what is being done is uh, they're recreating the structure of a forest, but they're doing it all with edible and, and useful plants. Uh, so they'll be edible, they'll be medicinal, they'll be used for fibre, for, for animal feed, various things, but basically they'll, they'll all be useful, but it looks and feels like a forest. And I'll, I'll come back to why, why that's worth doing later. The big problem for me, of course, is that there's a big difference between doing something in Indonesia and doing it in the, the north of Scotland. So this wasn't something I could, I, I was really struck by this, by this talk, but it wasn't something I could immediately apply. But it turned out there's a kind of tradition of trying to apply this in uh, the UK. Um, 
this, this is uh, Robert Hart, who after Second World War uh, came back and tried out for his temperate forest gardening on his family farm in Shropshire. Uh, and this is Martin Crawford, who's maybe got best known forest garden uh, on a few hectares down in, down in Devon. Uh, but there's still a bit of a kind of southwest bias there. Not everything that works works for them works works up in the northeast of Scotland. So I've really spent the last 20 years or so since I got a growing space we could use for this, experimenting with applying the, the techniques, the, the species, and everything to to uh, a Scottish situation and to the development situation as well. And I have found that you have to do things a wee bit differently. Uh, principles are the same, the, the practice comes out a little bit differently. So one thing that's, that's different is uh, thinking about forest structure. Uh, this might be what you think of as, as forest, um, but this is not what we're aiming for in a forest garden. Uh, you'll see here on the, the ground layer, there's, there's virtually nothing. Um, and in the, uh, the, the canopy layer, everything's, everything's out of reach. Uh, and this is fairly typical of, of Scottish forests. Uh, they have few, fewer layers than a, a tropical one in Indonesia. So what we're aiming for really is something a bit more like this. Uh, this is the forest edge. Uh, it's more open. Uh, it's got a mix of ground layer, shrubs, uh, small trees in it. And you'll see this is this is wild. So we're talking about things like gorse, heather, rowan. But you'll see that things are within reach and it's a very productive system. Uh, and if we go back to the picture of my blog and kind of flip between them, you'll see you'll see a structural similarity if, if different different species. Um, so why, why would you actually do forest gardening? What's the, the advantage of it? Uh, well, I usually explain that using this plant. Uh, forest gardens are mostly perennials. They're mostly plants that stay, stay in situ and go on year after year. Um, and this is an example of one of those, this, this Turkish rocket. It's kind of as you can probably see, like a, a perennial equivalent of uh, sprouting broccoli. Um, you, you harvest the, the flower shoots and use them in, in quite a similar way. Uh, but whereas sprouting broccoli is, is biennial after it, uh, after you get the, the produce, first thing you do is pull it up, uh, chuck it in the compost heap. Um, then you've got bare soil again, You've got to, to think about rotation. You've got to start trying to, to raise uh, little little seedlings again with all the, the complications of that. Uh, you've got bare soil for a while, which doesn't hold on to, to nutrients very well. What happens after harvesting with Turkish rocket is this. Uh, it runs to, to flower extravagantly. Um, and you, you'll see from the, the flowers, it's in the cabbage family, one of the, the crucifers. Um, <clears throat> and apart from being very attractive, uh, the flowers are, are covered in these, these wee guys, uh, hoverflies, and it also attracts butterflies and other pollinators. But the larvae of ho hoverflies eat uh, green fly. So uh, one advantage is that you're kind of getting a lot of your pest control for free. Um, Another advantage is that plants stay in the soil, so they're um, suppressing weeds. Weeds aren't really getting a, a look in, uh, so you're getting quite a bit of the, the weeding for free as well. Um, and also these plants are very deep rooted. Uh, I don't have a picture of Turkish rocket, but this is another one I grow called Sweet Sicily. Uh, and you, you'll see how deep the, the roots are. So these roots are going right into the subsoil and they're, they're really making sure it's a permanent root system they're making sure that no nutrients are, are lost to the system at, at all uh, 
and we now know that they're even sort of trading these nutrients between plants, uh, between the ground floor of the trees, the shrubs, uh, in the in the mycorrhizal network in the soil as well. <clears throat> so again, you're getting a lot of the, the fertility of the uh, of the forest garden for for free as well. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just have a, a run through a few of the, the species in the forest garden because this um, this technique doesn't apply that well to all the things you might normally grow in uh, an allotment, although it does with, with some of them. Now, you can grow literally hundreds of, of species in this system, and I, I do, um, even in a, a regular size allotment. Uh, so this is really just to, to give you a flavor of some of the, the sorts of kinds of species you've got. Um, <clears throat> going from the tree layer down, this is Japanese plum. Uh, Japanese plum is another one that's popular with the, the hoverflies. Uh, and it's very heavily fruiting. I, of my, my one Japanese plum tree, I've got 100 weight of, of plums one year. And uh, this is one of my, my neighbor's kids with, with some of them. And uh, these are actually the plums you buy in the shops, you know, the sort of round, tasteless, hard ones. Uh, it turns out they're like that because they pick them green and uh, try to, to ripen them off the tree. If you pick them ripe off the tree, they are the most delicious plum I've ever had, a really sort of luscious, uh, complex flavour. Uh, you can also get salad off a tree. This is um, small leaved lime and uh, as with a, a lot of these things it's the, the fresh growth that you're, you're eating and the great thing about small leaved lime is it tends to produce flushes of new growth uh, pretty much throughout the, the growing season and if instead of harvesting individual leaves you, you pick the whole end shoot and chuck that in your salad bowl uh, then it will respond by breaking more buds and producing even more fresh growth. So I, I call it the more you pick, the more you get. It's a, it's a handy feature of, of a lot of perennials. Um, this is uh, the, the small leaf lime is a Scottish native. This is far less familiar. This is uh, Koshiabura, uh, which is a, a Japanese sansai or, or mountain herb. The, the Japanese have a very strong tradition of uh, springtime foraging uh, greens from the, the mountain. And with Japan's geography, most people live fairly close to, to a mountain. Uh, and what you, again, is the, the spring shoots, um, but in this case, you'll uh, boil them a couple of changes of water and then put some, some soy sauce and, and lemon juice on them. And uh, they're quite delicious like that. Uh, you can even grow spices on a tree. Uh, this is Sichuan pepper um, with its, its peppercorns. Uh, they have an amazing effect. They make your mouth go kind of numb and tingly at the same time. Uh, but very, very, very popular in Chinese cooking and very nice. Um, it's a well defended tree. You don't have to get on the wrong, wrong side of it. Uh, but there it's the, it's actually the seed cases rather than the, the seeds that are the, the main part that's used. And all these tend to be either small trees or like so the Koshiabura and the lime, I actually cut them to to hedge size more or less, so to um, to no more than a couple of meters. Uh, partly to keep an allotment rules, uh, but also partly so I can I can keep things within reach, and I can uh, do that. The more you pick, the more you get. Thing I, I can keep encouraging these these flushes of new, new growth. The shrub layer is where you tend to find the more traditional um, Scottish fruits, uh, a lot of which are actually uh, forest edge species naturally, so likes of currants, likes of brambles, likes of uh, raspberries. 
they, they all actually naturally grow in the forest edge. So they, uh, they grow quite happily in, in this kind of system. Uh, this is the, the color change on one of my, my favorite raspberry varieties. Uh, some less familiar ones. Um, the, the blue fruit here is uh, uh, called Shalan berry. Um, it's quite shade tolerant relative of, of blueberry. Uh, has a sort of milder flavor than blueberry. And then the uh, strawberries are alpine strawberries, which will grow a little bit in the ground layer. Um, some of the shrub layers are, are actually herbaceous perennials. This is my brother, who's about six foot, uh, standing next to Udo, another Japanese plant in the, uh, the Botanic Garden here in Aberdeen. And Udo um, grows phenomenally quickly there because it gets to this height in more or less in a few weeks in, in spring uh, with very thick shoots. Uh, you can use the, the fresh uh, growth again, the, the young unfurling leaves, but you can also use the, the pith if you pair off the, the skin from these, these shoots. It's got a sort of citrusy, uh, resiny flavour to it. Uh, this is salt bush, um, so called because the, the leaves actually have a salty flavour, so um, a nice one to pick for the salads. Um, and then right down into the, the ground layer of the forest, you've got things like wild garlic, which will be coming up fairly soon, probably. Um, and wild garlic obviously is famous for having that garlicky taste, but Actually, the most useful thing about wild garlic is if you cook it, it loses that garlic flavor and it's like a, it's more of a bulk vegetable, sort of an oniony. Uh, yeah, it's like a cross between onion and spinach, you, you might say, and uh, grows pretty pro prolifically, even in, in very shady areas, available for several months of the year, up to about June, usually. Another one from the ground layer, this is, uh, this is called dog's tooth violet, and it's maybe unusual for, for shade in that it produces uh, a starchy root that you can eat, uh, which really does look like a, a dog's tooth. You can see where it gets the, the name from, like a, a really large canine tooth. Um, this is... Uh, this is daylily, uh, or one of the, the daylilies. Uh, and this one's an edible flower. Um, again, it's a sort of Chinese uh, Far Eastern thing. What's actually eaten is mostly the, the young flowers, are, or even flower buds, are actually more nutritious than the, the open flowers. Although even when they're, when they're open, you can, you can still use them. They, they look amazing in a stir fry or Stuff like that. Um, and you'll, you'll probably recognize this one. People are usually surprised when they hear you can eat this. Uh, that this is not unusual. Apparently, when tomatoes were first introduced to the United States, for about 100 years, people thought they were poisonous. Uh, and it took a really long time to, to get going as a, um, an edible crop. Um, so, hosta is here just treated as a, an ornamental, but again, in the Far East, it's, it's grown as a, an edible crop. And again, it's the, the young emerging leaves that are, are nicest and, and most new, nutritious. So the, here's a large species, which I would, I would boil and, and dress, uh, or a smaller species I would probably stick in a, a stir fry. You can also grow mushrooms in forest garden. Uh, this is shiitake uh, grown on a, a log. So you can see I've sort of drilled little holes in this log and, and filled it with the mushroom spawn for shiitake. And then a year or year or so later, this is what you get popping popping out of it. And the kind of cool, moist uh, conditions of a, a lot of the forest garden are, are ideal for, for mushrooms to to grow in. Uh, 
not a stress-free thing, <laughs> but you can, you can also encourage animals into the, the forest garden and they will uh, be part of your, your pest control system as well. So I've talked about insects already, but I have a wee pond that encourages the, the frogs in and I also have a hedgehog box and a few habitat piles which uh, encourage these wee, these wee guys in as well. I'm just going to finish by saying a wee bit about uh, eating from the forest garden because I've really found that forest gardening has been at least as much of a, a culinary adventure as it has been a, a horticultural one. Uh, it's, yeah, the, these plants take a little bit of work out how to grow, but usually a bit more working out how to, to eat. And it's, it's often only really what, when you find the, the best recipe for something that you, you really unlock its potential. And again, we're mostly eating the, the shoots of things. Uh, traditionally, we only really think of maybe rhubarb and uh, asparagus as, as shoot vegetables, but there are so many more shoots you can eat than that. Uh, here's lovage, which is, has been blanched to make it a bit wild, uh, milder. And that's udo again, and uh, sweet sicily and hogweed there. Um, this is an edible fern. Uh, this is called ostrich fern. Um, and again, it's in this, this young emerging state when they're, they're still rolled up. These are called fiddleheads at this, this stage uh, that you can eat them. Uh, they do in fact taste a wee bit like asparagus. Uh, you can also eat young flower shoots. So this is the um, Turkish rocket again. Uh, and I was talking about uh, the, the cooking being the, the key to uh, unlocking it. So this is uh, some of these shoots I've just been showing you, uh, cooked tempura style, um, which we think of as a Japanese style again, but frankly, they're dipped in batter, uh, they're deep fried and they're dipped in something salty. So I don't think you really get more Scottish than that. Uh, so. So that's, uh, that's from my forest garden. Uh, and I'll finish there again. Um, I'll just mention the, the book that Scott mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the publisher, the, the printer is moving at the moment. No one can get hold of books, but uh, you, you can pre-order them on my, my website, uh, which I should have put up there. It's, but it's very simple. It's foodforest.garden. You want to check it out. And that is me. Great, thanks very much. That was really interesting. Um, I, I have a couple of questions of my own, but I'd prefer to, s to give someone else a chance first since I've, you know, I don't want to abuse my power on the mic here. Do we have any questions from anyone in the audience? can see Christine you've just unmuted yourself and Rona you've got your hand up so if you want to go after Christine. It's just a question about starting um, when you began the forest garden did you have in mind a kind of plan of those different layers and the plants that you were going to in or has a lot of it just growing up by chance? <laughs> uh, mostly the latter. Um, yeah. I I didn't start with a plan to turn the whole allotment into a forest garden. Um, and actually, I should say, it still isn't. Uh, I find forest gardening and traditional allotment growing are very complementary. Because uh, forest gardening, you've got this great pulse of production in the spring, in the sort of traditional hungry gap for, uh, for growing in Scotland. Uh, but then a lot of those things harden off. And there's not actually so much available in the summer. Um, and that's when you've got all the, the things from your, your more traditional beds. Um, so yeah, I just started with a, a few things um, and I'd already got the kind of principles. So I, I planted a bit wild garlic under my apple tree and, and things like that. But yeah, it's more just, I did more and more experiments and eventually they, they joined up and <laughs> basically clean up. Oh, the fun. And, oh, I've got a forest garden. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, Rona, do you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, um, that was a great talk. Oh, thank you. Um, I really liked the thought and thought it was a forest or a jungle. Um, absolutely brilliant. Um, and such a great diversity that you had with both trees and bushes and wild plants and fruit. Um, my question is, how do you encourage and promote this? You know, when a, a lot of plot holders like the structure, and um, also is in the constitution. And I think your allotment is behind closed doors. So do you have um, a solution to an open allotment and how you marry both and get people to accept different ways of what a, an allotment looks like, basically, you know, some of it is structured and that's great if that's what people want, but how do you also sort of say, um, it can be a bit of a jungle and a bit of a forest and I'm doing this because this is what grows and this is what encourages biodiversity. Um, so various ways of answering that. Uh, I think one thing is that that's, that's probably uh, uh, an allotment site by allotment site question uh, that that's a discussion to be had on on each allotment site and as I say I think I have an advantage on, in that I'm on a fairly small one so I can do that relatively easy um, I also have the advantage that Aberdeen City Council have been reasonably understanding <laughs> what I'm doing I I did get a, a notice uh, at one point that I clearly wasn't cultivating my allotment <laughs> Uh, but I was able to write back and say that I am cultivating it, that everything there is stuff I'm going to eat. Uh, can I show you uh, what I'm doing? And I dragged some poor woman around my allotment. <laughs> going, and I eat this bit of this one. But eventually she said, okay, okay. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, and also in doing that, I think it's good not to be any more messy or unkempt or anything than, than you have to be. Uh, so for instance, I, I do still grow things in um, straight rows as much as I can. Uh, I have a good path network. Uh, I try not to let it become untidy with crap lying around. Um, just to, to say this is a, a serious allotment, if you like. I think the fact I've been doing it for 20 years and nothing's gone horribly wrong helps as well. Um, the closed doors bit, uh, I'm, I'm also doing this in the, the community at large. Uh, in fact, we've got a community garden behind our community centre, which is, it's not really got the trees because it's got a lot of trees around it anyway, um, but it's got the, the lower layers making use of a rather shady spot. Um, and I think forest gardening is actually really good for that sort of thing because it's very resilient. Um, you can you can come and jump on half of these plants and they'll barely notice. Uh, you can come and strip all the the flaring shoots off a Turkish rocket, um, and it won't care. It'll come back next year. Whereas if you come and pull up a cabbage, uh, that's that's it. That's the um, so they, they sort of share the produce out more naturally uh, because you've got to put some work in to get some, some produce out. Uh, so we've got a kind of open, open harvesting uh, policy in the community garden. And in fact, I've got a fairly open pol harvesting policy in the allotment because it produces at times a year far more than I can, I can eat. Uh, and so I let the kids come in they're going to come in anyway um, and they uh, it's amazing how how much kids will be into things that you probably couldn't make them eat if you tried to they <laughs> would come in and uh, strip your gooseberry bushes or whatever <laughs> and the final answer to that uh, is to say the book and the blog and I'm sort of trying to put information out uh, that way as well 
Well, thank you. That's great. And I'll definitely buy you a book. <laughs> Judy, you've got your hand up too. Yes, it was really to ask you about marrying traditional um, plots with the forest garden edges. Um, how big are the, the traditional patches that you have? Do you have sort of four that you rotate or, or how do you manage that? And what do you grow on the traditional part? I mean, is it in the middle of your plot or is it at the edge or, or how does it work, Alan? Uh, it's at the edge. Um... I kind of got it segregated in that I've got the, the deep forest on the northernmost um, side of it. Uh, I've then got my sunny edge to the south of that. That's the, the sun-loving perennials that want to be in the open. So that's things like the, the daylily uh, that I showed you. Um, and then I've got my annual beds. And I've, I've only got a few, few beds left, actually, of, of annual stuff. Uh, but that's things like uh, lettuce and market and uh, runner beans, that sort of thing. Um, and then I've got my sitting having a cup of tea space uh, just, just to the south of that. Um, there are then um, some traditional crops that I grow actually more in about the forest garden. So tatties, um, I think of tatties as being annuals, but they are actually perennials. Uh, they, the perennial organ is the potato. They, they naturally come back year on year. Um, and I, I grow a few particularly uh, light resistant varieties and I also uh, raise them from, from seed. Um, and I do rotate those around little, little patches within the forest garden. Um, Similarly, things like broad beans, uh, anything with a really big propagule that gets going really quickly, uh, be it a broad bean or a tie, uh, tends to be suitable for growing within the forest garden. So there's, there's a few different ways of integrating it. Thank you. I had a question about the difficulties of, of Having a plot like that where you don't do a lot of ground uh, cultivation, you don't do a lot of ground tending down at ground level. When I've, so to say for example in my plot I've got a big problem with mare's tail. You said that you get a lot of weed suppression for free because you've sort of got that canopy I guess if nothing else across your soil by growing that way. But I wondered if you knew of anyone who'd tried with such pervasive weeds that are really really deep rooted and are just determined to take over no matter what I seem to be able to do to them. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, can I just go plug myself in or I might disappear while I was on battery? <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> I'm also very happy to take advice from anybody else who's sitting in the audience about how to deal with Mare's tail. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing is I, I do tend to recommend that people are starting a forest garden, but uh, no, no dig be damned. The first thing you do is, is dig it over really well and get out all these perennial weeds um, because they'll, uh, yeah, if you leave them in, they'll be a, a pain uh, potentially forever. Um, but also if you, if you do have plants in situ all the time, it does actually become much easier to, to pull out stuff like like mare's tail. Uh, if you just keep on it, basically, um, and instead of having loads of bare soil to itself each time, uh, you it's fighting up through the, um, the vegetation around it each time. Uh, so by the... Um, yeah, it, it's much easier to, to reconnect, basically. So, okay. yeah, I mean, there's, we've got everything in the allotments. So we've got couch grass, we've got uh, ground elder, etc., etc. Um, you, you do have to be able to, to deal 
deal with it or if it was a system that could be taken over by these these plants they they would be okay okay i guess ideally you would just choose a site that didn't have such a, a problem in the first place but Wouldn't that be great yes. <laughs> yeah okay thanks if anyone else has any questions just now feel free to just reach forward and unmute yourself and, and chip in let me have a look and see if we have any in the chat as well Hi, Alan. Um, I wondered, I, I don't have an allotment um, I'm growing in my, just in my garden, um, but I was thinking my back garden is just raised beds because it's got a really steep slope and then just a flat playing area for the kids. But my front garden is just grass at the moment. Um, and I was thinking about kind of food foresty thing. It's uh, kind of north facing, so it's pretty shady. But I don't know if you have any kind of tips for uh, I don't know, anything you would do different for forest gardens um, if they were actually your garden, if that makes sense. If it was in like a, a more kind of accessible place that wasn't kind of your allotment, you know, there's a possibility of people walking across it and things like that. Mm. Um, yeah, any tips for, for front gardens being turned into forest gardens? Um, I guess one thing is plan, plan your path network well. You, you always need to to do this for an, uh, a forest garden anyway, because it's so grown up. If there were no no paths through it, you, you'd really struggle to actually harvest your your food. Um, and if you kind of observe where people are going anyway, what what lines they're using, and then make those the the paths. Uh, I guess I'd also say that forest gardens, I think, blend themselves very well to being your garden. I mean, around my, my flat, I have planted with this sort of edible stuff as well. Uh, a lot of it's pretty attractive uh, plants. Um, and as I was saying, a lot of it's pretty robust as well. So it, uh, it might even grow, um, grow better than some of the uh, more traditional crops in a, a garden. Um, I would, say, I would say still delineate your beds well, uh, even if you don't actually have to do raised beds or whatever for a, a forest garden, maybe kind of make sure it's it's obvious what is the, the bed and, and what isn't and, and try to, to hold that line. Um, addressing what you're saying about the slope, uh, I've actually got my allotment sort of terraced. Um, I say sort of because it's not on a, a very steep slope, although it's on a little one. Um, it's terraced only on the north end of beds, and that's to kind of tilt the, the whole bed up towards the, the sun and get, get a bit more uh, use of sun. And then I've got the paths on the, you know, below, below that terrace, which are, are getting more shaded. So I'm just trying to, to ruin a little bit more uh, sunlight out of the, the allotment as a, a whole. Um, and I think, yeah, there's, there's no reason not to, to terrace a, a forest garden. Um, but equally, there's no reason not to have a lot of these things growing on a, a bit of a slope um, because you don't have the, the bare soil that you're, you're worried about getting, getting washed away uh, in, in the same sort of way that you, you do with with traditional beds. Is, is any of that helpful for your, your particular garden? Yes, that was great, thank you. Yeah, we've already got some, so the garden set up at the back, like I said, is, is a really steep slope. <laughs> um, <laughs> that really was kind of the only option we felt was to kind of have this set up, but we did kind of around the two tiers of raised beds, there's, we've planted some trees and some fruit bushes. So I suppose we've kind of, started some of those layers but yeah there's there's quite a lot of bare soil all around so um although I'd kind of thought about putting some you know like comfrey underneath fruit trees and things like that um that's a, a really good idea to actually maybe populate those areas a bit more with some of the, the other suggestions that you had mm. thank you very much and although comfrey seems very popular in forest garden I actually find that a lot of the crop plants do that function of of 
bringing up nutrients anyway, uh, of holding on to nutrients. So I, I don't have, uh, well, there's, there's one or two little patches, but I, I don't have my forest garden full of, of comfrey because I, I don't really think it's necessary. Can I ask about fertilising and composting? Do you use fertiliser and compost and, and how do you, what do you manage or is it the leaves or, or sufficient? Um, I don't use any artificial fertilisers. Um, I'm very, very opportunistic basically about chucking any fertility into the, the system that I can. Um, so certainly household waste uh, gets composted and, and goes in. Uh, but also if I'm cutting the hedge in front of the flat, um, the, the clippings will get spread on the, uh, the paths and they're then walking on those will help break them down. They'll, they'll sort of go into the soil uh, as, as a whole. Forests are very good at taking any nutrients that go, go into them, <laughs> basically. Uh, and, and holding on to them. Um, so you, you don't have the, the question that you have with annual growing of having to put the fertility in at a particular point when it's needed for, for growth. You can really, um, so again, if, if my neighbor's cutting their grass, I'll, I'll get the cuttings and they'll, they'll, they'll go in. I'll, I'll take any fertility that's gone more or less. Uh, but what I won't do is I use any, any fossil fuels to, to create fertility to, to go into the, into the allotment. Sorry, can I have a supplementary on it too? Um, I have problems with my blueberries because obviously they need acid um, compost. Um, do you? How do you do with the liming and the and and the the um, the, the ericaceae stuff? Um, it's interesting. When when I right when I started the allotment, I, I designated one bed as the the acid bed, um, and I haven't really done anything to maintain it as such, other than mulching it and never liming it. And a while ago, I, I got the, um, the pH tested in all sort of various parts of the garden. And it was, it was sort of 6.5 across most of the garden. Um, but it was, uh, I think it was sort of down about 4.5 or 5 in, in the acid bed. So it, it definitely was noticeably more, more acid than, than the rest of the garden. Sorry, so, so they've just maintained themselves actually over the years. Uh, yeah, and as I say, I will, I will mulch it with um, also with, if I can get my hands on stuff like uh, pine, pine needles or whatever, I'll have to chuck those on it as well. Right, just, just as pine needles, I mean you don't yeah. come you just put pine needles or, or bracken or something like that on it. Yeah, because again, this is how, how a forest works. Stuff just falls on the surface and it, it breaks down uh, into the soil. It's only really if you dig this kind of undigested stuff in that you, you get the problems with, with nitrogen robbery. There's a, there's a whole system for, for breaking stuff down on the surface and, and putting it into the the soil so that's really where, where most of the, the fertility goes and then I rely on the system to, to take it in. Um, I, I live in Dumbarton um, so I'm not in Glasgow um, but um, um, there's a huge big estate just up from me and Woodland Trust have planted loads of trees there. And it's also a very old forest with waterfalls. And we have got loads and loads of wild garlic, brambles, all that sort of stuff. And moving away from allotments, but just maybe a bit of guerrilla gardening. Um, but school kids are involved. I just, you know, would you recommend planting something there? Or 
you know, um, to bring up the forest in a, in a natural forest habitat, which it's not an allotment, but just to um, bring the knowledge of that, really. Yeah, um, I would, I would kind of carry with that. Um, I would definitely stick to just native species when you're doing that. Uh, a lot of what I grow in my allotment aren't native species. Um, it was vegetables and fruits, really. It was like, could you put tatties underneath it? And yeah, uh, ba basically no. <laughs> um, the, there's a few reasons for that. One is that a lot of these things aren't really adapted to to growing in a forest. They're they're adapted to annual cultivation, uh, so they'll they'll die out pretty quickly in the forest. The other thing is going back to this Indonesian idea of a home garden. Um, the the gardener is very much part of the garden, and the, the fact you're you're down there every every day or so, almost kind of foraging in your your allotment, uh, is very much a, a part of the, the setup. Um, it's not stuff that you can just plant off off in the forest. Uh, in in the same way. So yeah, I, I would do a bit of foraging and enrichment and new planting maybe with, with wild garlic, uh, that, that sort of thing, but not, um, and stuff like uh, raspberries and um, gooseberries, they're, they're easy to propagate and they'll, they'll add interest. Uh, they'll probably get shaded out over time, but, um, and this, I would say, where, where's the harm in that? Uh, definitely. Uh, so, yeah, to, to a degree, but with some, with some caveats. That's great. Thank you. Great, thanks. I'm looking at the time. We're at five to the end of the published time slot here. We still have time for another question or maybe two, if anyone has any. Okay, well, I'm sure if anything occurs to you later, then you might be able to, I'm, I'm sure Alan would be happy to for people to contact and, and drop queries to him. Um, we we'll put the link to your website, Alan, into the chat here. So if anyone's watching, it's easily clickable there if you just open the chat box and they can see more about uh, everything you've posted on your own site. But for now, I'll maybe just say thanks very much. It's been a really interesting conversation and I think we've got a good balance here with tonight's session between information and then plenty of time for questions so it's been really great thanks very much for agreeing to join us and every, everyone else we've got another couple of events left in febfest go to the glasgow allotments forum webpage at glasgowallotments.org slash febfest if you want to see what those are and sign up and if not then enjoy your evening and uh, and the rest of your weekend bye bye cheers and thank you